So with that, I'd like to introduce Virginia Pratt. Thank you, thank you, Mayor. Well, I want you to know I was known as Pratt the Brat the Water Rat. <laughs> As you will know in a minute, you'll understand why that name carries with it some challenges. Not only does it rhyme with Pratt, I mean with Rat and, and Brat, but it, it has a meaning in the British language of somebody who is a fool, a total idiot. Oh. You can simply, it's only a Google away, so check it if you don't believe me. Yeah. Furthermore, a pratfall is a fall on one's bottom. So you can quickly extract that prat means derriere, or rear end, or whatever you wish to call it. Well, <clears throat> that made the beginning of my dad's life a challenge, because not only was his surname Pratt, his middle name was Buttfield. <laughs> Harlan Buttfield Pratt, that's where the story begins. In November of 1914, he was born in East Orange, New Jersey, where his paternal grandparents happened to live. After my great-grandfather had spent many years traveling the world in a square rigger and lied about his age, in order to get a position signed by Secretary of the Navy, Theodore Roosevelt, in World War I. They lived in North, my dad suddenly migrated from uh, East Orange to North Plainfield with the help of his parents, I guess. And they lived in North Plainfield, and they lived in Plainfield, uh, actually until my grandparents, respectively, my paternal grandparents died. Now I'm going to put on my glasses because I don't remember the rest of what I was going to say. As he grew, I'm certain he was imbued with a sense of respect and pride for his heritage, as we all should have. But his maternal side was just off the boat from England and his paternal side disembarked from the Mayflower in 1620. Now let's have a bit of fun. Have you ever thought about how many great, 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 great grandparents you have? We all know we have two parents, right? And we mostly know we have four grandparents. How many great grandparents do we have? Two times two is four, and four times two is eight. Hey, I didn't become a CPA for nothing. Okay. <laughs> so if you had eight great grandparents, how many great great would you have? Sixteen. And on it goes. Okay? Sixteen, thirty-two, twenty-eight. I mean, thir thir 32, 64, 128. By the time you get to eighth great grandparent, it's 256. We all, not just human beings, but dogs and cats and everybody else, have 256 eighth great grandparents. Now, this gentleman right, sitting right here and I are the ninth. Great, 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 that should be nine. Of the 512, nine great grandparents, ninth great grandparents that we have. Well, <clears throat> to say therefore that Harlan Buttfield Pratt's <clears throat> great, great, and there we go, up to eight grandparents were John Alden and Miles Standish. I'm sure we all learned who they were in, when we studied Thanksgiving in elementary school. Doesn't mean much when one has, stops to realize that they're just two of the 256. 
In any case, I share this with you because it was a great source of pride for my grandfather, Harlan Buttfield Pratt's father, who mercifully was not called Harlan Buttfield Pratt, <clears throat> who inculcated into me before he died when I was just not yet 10 years old, how important this family heritage was. Well, in spite of that nice beginning, my dad had a lot of early struggles. He may, be, may have been a learned student of genealogy and colonial lines, times, but when it came to academics, he was a zero. In fact, his parents and his siblings were all college graduates, somewhat unusual for the year 1920 or thereabouts, 25. He didn't make it through high school. The only sport in which he was ever interested in was sailing, so he didn't have that avenue to pursue. Uh, but he was an entrepreneur from the get-go, or get-go, or the beginning, however you wish to say it. In the seventh grade, he had a printing business, to quote him, and I'm able to do that because a certain person sitting to my lower right made a developed a, a uh, report, shall we say, on many conversations with HB. We'll call him HB from now on. It's a little nicer, don't you think, than Harlan Budfield. Uh, quote, I did a lot of work with that printing press. I made my spending money with that, and I had a lot of fun with it. In 1928, he built a steam-powered uh, boat at summer camp. When he was 16, he made a half-hull sailboat model and carved the sails out of solid pine. It was, a, it was built in on the wall at 30 Valley Road at the foot of the stairs. There was a recess built for him. You'll know where 30 Valley Road is as I go on with this story. This, <clears throat> by the way, the ship's model is currently missing in action, I understand. In the early 1940s, he made bronze frogs and turtles for paperweights and made 30,000 brass candle snuffers sold through a New York wholesaler. He had many jobs in the early days and in many different places during the 30s and before he got married in 1941. And so he spent quite a bit of driving. The most enduring story, and one that speaks volumes about him, is the hard-boiled egg story. And look who's shaking their heads, my son and my brother. <clears throat> he was traveling on one of his various trips to New Bedford, Massachusetts, or wherever it was he was working, and he had a chum in the car with him. Now, remind, mind you, this was long before the days of McDonald's and other fast food operations. By the way, one of the first McDonald's was right down on, on Route 29, also now known as Route 22. Right down there. You remember as you're shaking. Okay, good. I hope there are lots of heads shaking in agreement before I'm finished today. At any rate, this chum said to him, they'd been driving for a couple of hours, and he said, uh, Harlan, got anything to eat? And my dad said, yeah, there's a hard-boiled egg in the glove compartment. Oh. <laughs> oh, you're all laughing, huh? Before I even get to the punchline. Well, it makes the punchline even more powerful. So he opened up the glove compartment, he took out the hard-boiled egg. He turned to my dad, he said, got any salt? <laughs> and my dad said, put the egg back. You're not hungry. <laughs> my grandson told that story at the ripe old age of 10 years old at the celebration we had for his life in Maine. You know, that's the colonial times die hard. That's where the family plot is. 
When he was 10 years old, he told that story, and it was one of the great moments of my life that my 10-year-old grandson could get up and deliver that wonderful little story. H.B. always ate whatever was put in front of him, and he rarely left anything on his plate. He was extremely frugal in every way, which reflected throughout his years here in Washington and probably offended more than one or two people. At any rate, in the signature coffee table. Some of you, does anybody in this room by any chance own one? <laughs> Only family. Well, I want you to know that that table became the cornerstone of my dad's success. During the Walker-Turner strike, during World War II, or close, or yeah, just, yeah, during the war, um, he was laid off. And he started making them in the basement of his home in Plainfield. Put an ad in the House and Garden magazine of Better Homes and Garden, I guess they're both defunct now. And, to quote him, ship them as far as Belgium to the east and Hawaii to the west. It was a very important part of his beginnings. And he knew how to make those, or develop the forms for the castings. They had, they had uh, cast, uh, stove-based legs. And he learned how to do that kind of work with his, when he was making his frogs, uh -huh, like, like Buddy now has a friend. <laughs> I gave one of the treasured frogs, actually, uh, uh, turtles. I gave Frank a choice between a turtle and a frog, and he took the turtle because they have a turtle at home. At any rate, <clears throat> the, co the, the coffee table was the impetus for the biggest chapter in his life. Watch on. June 1st, 1947, after being castigated by his family when he said he was looking at a broken down old farmhouse on three acres in Wachung, they said, Wachung? Way out there? Why would you want to move there? That's a bad idea, opined his parents. But I must hasten to add, that a couple of years later, when his sister and her husband, Dr. William Goodspeed, decided that they'd like to move to Wachung, ah, oh, they thought it was a good idea. And Dr. Goodspeed actually was the town doctor and made many a visit to the school, which I attended, which I'll get to later. <clears throat> the three-acre so-called farm was a mess. I was three and a half years old, and I remember vividly one and only one thing before it became ours, because needless to say, he ignored his parents' concerns and he bought the farm. What I remember is the laundry on the bank of the brook. Oh my gosh, it was spread out to dry in the sun. No clothesline and no plumbing, let alone a what? No washing machine or plumbing. And an outhouse. Now this is 1947, 29 miles from New York City. And there were homes in Wachung. They weren't the only one because where the Wachung Rescue Squad presently resides was the site of more privies for the tenants that lived in the rundown building right on the corner as you come around the bend onto Sterling Road from Somerset Street. And across the street from what's now just a gas station, and next to the gas station is a vacant lot. But that was a very important part. That vacant lot housed the grocery store, 
and uh, a little uh, candy kind of store. And there were other things there on that strip, like a, like a drug store with, 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 with seats at the, at the counter to sit and have a, have a soda or an ice, you know, ice cream or whatever in the drug store. And down a little ways was Ted's place where he had a little restaurant. And then there was Mr. Walter's plumbing store. And then farther down, as you're looking straight toward the gas station and going south on Somerset, there was a beauty parlor. Well, I didn't go to that, as you could probably tell. I don't you see the pictures, but I had pigtails for a very long time. And that was the center. Okay, the center was that strip right there on Somerset Street. And I would walk there frequently um, to the store. The, the, the grocery store had a butcher, his name was Al. And we got pretty much everything we needed on a daily basis right in Wachung. And you know, a lot of people, particularly women, didn't have cars. So that was how we operated. Well, we did put plumbing and electricity into the house before we moved in. And, but HB was neither a plumber nor an electrician. Those are the only two jobs he always subcontracted. So much of other things he did himself. You'll learn about this in a minute. Anybody think that looks familiar? Maybe if I invert it, it'll look more familiar. Summer of 1947. Mother, Daddy, thank you. Mother, Daddy, Debbie, my two-year-old sister, and I moved to watch home. From the first to the last moment, some 26 years later, my life at the corner of Sterling and Valley Road, because that's what it was known before they assigned numbers to anything, when we were RFD3, Plainfield, Paracas, Wachung, New Jersey, as you'll see on the notice of the auction for October 3rd, 1947, be sure to see it before you leave. Frank has two of them now. The, the reproduction was better than the original, and I don't even know which is which, but one of the two is original. <clears throat> and you'll see that on the lawn, in front of the old house, as we called it, my dad pitched a tent and had the, one of the very first, if not the first, auctions of his career. <clears throat> My favorite spot at the old house was the brook. Pollywogs, minnows, mother's colanders to catch them with, waiting, sitting in the mini pools, nirvana. I loved playing in that brook. I didn't have any brothers until I was 20 years old. And I was a tomboy. And I was my father's surrogate son in many ways. So I loved playing in that brook and getting skinned knees and so on all through my childhood. <clears throat> From day one, HB worked every minute of every day. Auctions, antiquing, refinishing, selling. A big vat full of wood stripper. Big deep thing. Uh, you could drown in it. I'm not kidding. I mean, a person, a child could drown in it. <clears throat> and a spray room for all of his tables and his, he, his contract to make plywood uh, frames for, for pocketbooks for somebody down in South Plainfield or something. Uh, and he had, at one point, he had. Uh, several young, quote him, boys working for him uh, in that operation. And he made $500 a week, according to the record. And that was quite a lot at that time. But the antiques, the estates, 
the auctions. Uh, he had a relationship with Clarence Johnson, not from Wa Chung, uh, at the Plainfield Trust Company. I don't even know if that bank still exists, does it, Frank? At any rate, this gentleman dealt with estates, and so he knew my dad. He knew my dad was very conscientious and would, would know the value of things. And sometimes HB would have to buy the entire contents of a house to get one or two treasures. But he did. And he always agreed in the contract, whether he had an auction at the house or not, to leave the place, quote, broom clean. I used those brooms more than once in my day, helping daddy to clean up the place before we left. The auctions were phased out in the 1950s, but HB continued to buy antiques right up until the Pratt Building opened in 1959. And the Valley Shop then officially became the Valley Furniture Shop. <clears throat> it became more difficult to buy and process the type of furniture that HB saw in terms of, of uh, uh, antiques and so on. And so the focus turned to exclusively top value reproductions. Now this is important, uh, particularly since Frank Foursyllable taught me that people in his realm of activity used to come to watch on to buy furniture. And they were the Short Hills type. I don't even know if Short Hills exist today, but they were the Lottie Da ones. And they came to watch on to buy the furniture because Daddy bought top quality furniture because he knew how to make it. He didn't was not interested in you know something that's popular today. You know, uh, soft wood coated with chocolate that people buy for their home. But that's in style today. I call it chocolate, but you know, it's really not chocolate. It's dark stain. And so, Spencer Kite, to whom the Valley Shop was sold in 1974, continued this practice the entire time he owned the Valley Furniture Shop. Thank you, Spencer. He's not here today. He was a high school kid. He was really cute when I was in grade school. And I always kind of looked up to Spencer because he was, you know, high school guy. At any rate, <clears throat> He refused to cheapen the Valley Furniture Shop inventory, which gradually lost out to the changing tastes and production locales, you can figure that one out for yourself, of the 21st century. Now, one thing I didn't tell you about my dad that occurred when he was 12 years old was he had a crooked arm. And this is interesting because, of course, he used his he used his arms and all the time. But when he was uh, 12 years old, he uh, fell out of a tree, and he had a compound fracture fracture of the left elbow, and he had a very very bad scar on his elbow. And his arm was crooked. Married with a kid, maybe helped to keep him out of World War II. At any rate. Um, he had a crooked arm, and he, it, he uh, favored it, and if you ever did anything more than touch it, he would, hit, he would just almost scream in pain. So he lived with that, in spite of all the things he did of a physical nature. <clears throat> Shortly after moving to Wachung, Dad built a concrete block structure behind the old house. That was his workshop. And then shortly thereafter, he built an annex. Those of you who've been here since the 40s, anybody here lived here since the 40s? Okay, so maybe you remember the red barn colored sloped annex that went down from the workshop. 
and the two together served as the premises for the work that I've already outlined for his business. Behind the house, because he lived in the house, he didn't really have a showroom of any kind, and so he used the annex, sort of, um, the part that wasn't taken up with all his spray rooms and saws and sanders and et cetera, et cetera. And then they were demolished and replaced with what was known as the ware room in the late 50s. Uh, and that building was destroyed by fire in December of 1968 and quickly replaced months later. Frank made some comment about that building not being very well constructed, and then later I read that my dad built it in 30 days. No wonder. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, the current building behind the landmark structure um, built in 1958, was built by a contractor. Uh, William Shrewsbury, I don't know if that name means anything to anybody here, but he was a local contractor, and he was the contractor. And the building was designed by Charles Detwiller, a longtime architect friend of my dad's from Plainfield. Now, as most of you may know, this 85-foot structure housed the United States Post Office, a dentist's office, a clothing shop owned by the Wendells of Wachung, and the Valley Furniture Shop. And this was put there in place of the old house to which I referred, and which you will see a picture of, was demolished and had served from 51 until 58 as the Valley Shop showroom, and it was demolished. Plus, in order to build this building, HB moved the brook, now I'm quoting secondhand my father, 20 feet to accommodate this wonderful new structure, and quote HB, and some of you may giggle at this. Quote, I had a lot of opposition. Let me tell you. But then I let everything cool off a little bit and ap applied for a zoning change, and I got it. So that building required a zoning change. Lest you think for one second, I've overlooked the construction of 30 Valley Road, that would be impossible. We lived in the old house, still think of it as the old house, from 1947, as I said, until my birthday, September 3rd, 1951. We moved about 150 feet or so to the new house, which to me, still the new house quietly named the Four Sisters because two more daughters appeared in early 49 and early 51, Rennie and Sue Tucker's friend, Janie. The construction of this homestead, known since 1973 as the Watchung Library, was a colossal undertaking given that HB was his own contractor and had a seven-day job running the valley shop. And by the way, in early days of Wachung, uh, he was also involved, as you, with uh, uh, being the president of the school, PTA Uha. But get to that in time. So he was a busy man at that time. <clears throat> and as I said, he was his own contractor, and he had a seven-day job running the Valley Shop. The Gamble, the Gamble Roof, thanks Rick, the Gamble Roof um, 
popular for barns and sheds. You know, it goes like this. But not so common for residences, became HB's favorite style, and he used it many times on later structures in other places, such as Mantelokey. <laughs> I remember much of the construction process. This is a shingle from 30 Valley Road that I treasure. Why? Because Dad filled a vat with gray stain and every single cedar shingle on that house was dipped into the stain, and I participated in this very highly skilled activity of <laughs> dipping the shingles. And you can see that the original color is pretty much still the color of the building today. But that's why the house still has its original facade, siding I should say, and even though it has been painted, because it had this great preservative that my dad probably concocted out of something that was on sale somewhere because he loved bargains, as we all know in the family. At any rate, that's what that is. <clears throat> and I brought this in my suitcase, and my son arrived today with a piece of wood sticking out of his bag for his uncle. And if that isn't a weird thing, I, I don't know what is. <clears throat> At any rate, I remember much of the construction process, particularly the plastic and lath installers, and being told it was one of the last places in the entire area. That would include Plainfield. <clears throat> um, having such walls, because of course, sheetrock took over uh, very shortly thereafter. The house cost $25,000 per HB. I remember writing checks for the mortgage. It was $106 a month. The Four Sisters was our mansion. Five floors, six bedrooms. When Sister Jane learned how to swim at last, it seemed, in 1956, Dad built a swimming pool. Boy, were we popular. Everybody in town suddenly loved the Pratts because we had a swimming pool. And we welcomed them all with open arms. And on that note, the house had a balcony off the back of it. It's not theirs anymore. It's been moved to the new, to the, what is the new addition. And from there, one could see that people always walked through up the driveway and then down the steps into the back of the, of the um, old, old house and then the Pratt building as a shortcut. Because the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. So if you're on Sterling Road and you want to get to the center to buy a pack of cigarettes like I did once and got caught, because anybody could buy them then. Little kids, I was a kid. My dad said, you want to smoke? Come sit in the living room and smoke. Oh, did I feel stupid. And my son had a similar experience. And to my knowledge, he never had another tobacco cigarette in his mouth. <laughs> At any rate, um, I got a, got a side to that. But people would come up the driveway and then go down there and walk all the way over to the center. Dad never said a word. Hey, he was in business. They could be a customer. And so he accepted it. There's one major exception that they'll happily tell you upon special request, but not right now. At any rate, we were popular with that pool. In 1962, Dad built a barn for my, quote, little sisters. Um, and they had a horse or two. Horses scared me. I was never too interested in them. I still love that home, and I dream of it returning to its former glory. Now, let's talk about Wachung and life in Wachung. My earliest memories, and those 
retired police officers that might be floating around here somewhere um, will appreciate this story because my earliest memory includes memory, plural, police chief Ralph Barrett. Anybody ever heard of Ralph Barrett? Yay, okay. Your father. Really? Woohoo! I want to see your hands. Not as big as her, his, his. Right, and guess what? See these? They're a miniature version of my dad's. And I said to him once, Dad, I have such ugly hands. He said, don't worry, they work well. <laughs> so from then on, I never apologized for the big hands, and my dad loved big hands. I learned, <clears throat> and from Ralph Barrett, sorry, I never called him Ralph Barrett, from Chief Barrett, I learned that the policeman is a little girl's friend. Thank you to your dad. And HB always made a point of admiring his hands because they were so big. Whenever he, I was in his presence, show me your hands, chief. Dad liked big, strong hands. Silly little things that we never forget. And I'm so, so happy I shared that story not knowing you'd be here. <clears throat> <clears throat> also, in the early days of life in Wachung, we sat on the front porch of the old house, looking out over the brook and looking at them. We didn't have a circle then. That circle was not built until the, somewhere in the 50s. I don't know exactly when. And one day, a car, after having come up from Somerset Street, turned right on the bend somehow didn't make it over the bridge and went off the bridge into the brook on the other side. And it was a, a woman with her daughter and two little children, two grandchildren. We didn't have a rescue squad then. This was prior, this is 1950 at the latest. Didn't have, a, didn't have one. I get, I, anyway, uh, Chief Barrett, that's why I was, Chief Barrett got there, of course, but these ladies were really, like, pretty upset. They weren't hurt, if you can imagine, I mean, seriously, if you can imagine. You know, cars then were built like battleships, and so maybe that protected them. We didn't have, they didn't have seatbelts, whatever. They were okay, but the car was in the brook, and they were on our front porch. And my mother, before driving them back home to... I don't know, Matuchin or something like that. Uh, noticed that the grandmother was getting kind of woozy. And so she, my mother ran into the house and got smelling salts? Anybody, I mean, who uses smelling salts in today's world? But mother used them and all of a sudden this woman perked up. So that's one of my early memories on that, on that porch and in the town. <clears throat> When I was eligible to start school in September 1948, and in those days, one didn't have to be five until December 31st, which is pretty neat because I didn't, I had just barely turned five since my birthday was in early September. Thank goodness, because I couldn't wait to start school. I'd been peering through the bushes and the partial fence for more than a year and all the kids going to and from the school contiguous to our property, which shall always be the, quote, old school to me. I think I was pretty disappointed when I found out I would not be going there. Why? Why? Everybody else had been going there. The new school up Sterling Road wasn't finished yet. So where was I to go? Not just I, but my, shall we say, 20 peers. Answer, the fireman's exempt hall next to the borough hall, uh, both of which have had their names changed, the latter to the municipal building. It was the borough hall to me then and now. <clears throat> the old school, which had eight grades in four classrooms, apparently thought it best 
not to put new kindergartners into the cramped quarters. I don't know exactly when everyone moved to the Watchung Barrow School on Valley View Drive or on the corner, whatever. The cornerstone was laid in 1948 and it was laid by my father, who at that time was president of the PTA and some other involvement um, that he was underqualified for. <laughs> but at any rate, um, we started there in 48. I looked for that cornerstone when I was here on June 29th, and I guess it's been gobbled up by the Valley View School Extensions. Or, yeah. At any rate, <clears throat> I do know that I started first grade there, and I stayed there until I graduated from eighth grade in 1957 before trotting off to Watchung Hills Regional High School, the first year of its existence. Prior to my going to high school in 1957, all high school students in Watchung went to North Plainfield High School and were bused down there. And I knew quite a bit about it because our babysitter, Shirley Christensen, who lived across the, from the Village Esso, which is now the Sunoco station on the, on the circle, she went there. And so from an early age, she even had a car with a rumble seat, which I rode in more than once. And so she went to school there. I knew they all had to take Latin. Oh boy, try to get a kid to take Latin in high school today. Okay, or try to get somebody to teach it. At any rate, that's where they had gone. <clears throat> My classmates and I are probably the only kids in Watch On History to be the first class to start in two new schools, Watch On Borough in 48 and Watch On Hills Regional in 1957. Throughout my grade school years, I had playmates in the neighborhood, who, by the way, as I already told you, had no indoor plumbing. We went Halloweening on, on Hillcrest Road. Everybody there had plumbing, I think. Um, and I, maybe I shouldn't say this, but Mrs. Uh, Bardelli and Mrs. Alberino always bought or gave us lots of goodies at Halloween and bought my Girl Scout cookies and then there was somebody else up the road a little farther whose name shall remain nameless who never bought anything from me, but I've never forgotten it. <clears throat> Wachung was a happy place to live in, or to live, I should say. The center, as we all called it, and I've already described it to you, <clears throat> was kind of the center of life in many ways. And the little, there was a little library in that rickety old building after, at, at the, on the bend that was the first library in Wachung. It was about as big as a couple of these tables. At any rate, the Valley Players. Anybody ever heard of the Valley Players? Yeah. Yay, okay. An amateur theater group regularly produced plays on the stage of the Borough Hall. And remember, I told you where the Borough Hall is. Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, Brownies were all popular with dedicated leaders. I have my five-year pin from scouting thanks to the leaders of our troops here in Wachung. The Wachung Lions Club took interest, interested kids. You didn't have to go, but I was one. I told you my dad had no interest in sports. We, didn't, we got a TV in the old house in 1946 uh, and had TV from then on, but HB never watched a sports game on TV in his life. Didn't have time for that, he was too busy. But they took interested kids to baseball games in New York. Now, wait till you hear this. Oh, you from Brooklyn? <laughs> <clears throat> he took us in 1953 to see the Brooklyn Dodgers 
and the Milwaukee Braves play, and I saw Duke Snyder, Roy Campanella, and Pee Wee Reese in flesh and blood. And it was one of the great joys of my childhood, and I never got to see another baseball game, P.S. I never really wanted to, in my life. But it was great fun. The club, the Lions Club, also had annual field days. Now, I had a real shocker yesterday when I was escorted to the Mobus Field and the, help me, the Phillips Field, right near what is now Valley View School, but to me will always be Watch on Borrow. Fields. We had a field. It was in the back of the school, which I know has been gobbled up by this creeping Valley View School. Creeping, not creepy. Creeping. <laughs> that was our playground. It was a baseball field, a football field, an every, everything play field. That was all we had. In those days, long before Title IX, which I hope every woman in this room knows about, <clears throat> that was the only sport activity for girls was to watch the boys play. <laughs> or when we were smaller, run around in the Chattahoochee graveled uh, playground, you know, with the swings and the slides, and the Chattahoochee gra uh, gravel is still in this knee. Really dangerous, and I must say, I was exposed yesterday to the facility at, uh, or not exposed to, but given a treat to see the playground at Bay Braybury School with this cushioned <laughs> playground. And I thought, wow, that'd be fun to fall on. Not like the one at Watch Young Borrow, where you took your life in your hands and fall on that one. Okay. Uh, but we did, there was no gym, no cafeteria, and in January and February, we had soup ladies for 25 cents a week, or if you didn't like uh, chicken noodle soup, you could only you could pay 20 cents because it was five cents a day. And the soup there were there were mothers, and they would come to the school and heat up the soup in these big Campbell soup, you know, from not put them in the soup cans, but big commercial Campbell soup cans in what was some I guess it was the teachers' break room because it had some kind of a stove in it at the school and they would put the soup in metal pitchers with metal labels and just they'd come around to the classrooms before they got there somebody would come in with a tray with the real bowls not styrofoam his boo or any other kind of thing that's polluting this world and destroying our oceans. And serve us soup, hot soup. And that's the closest thing we got to hot food in the whole nine years that I was from kindergarten, well, kindergarten was only half day, through eighth grade, okay? That was it, and we had no gym. And we stayed with the same teacher all day. Now, speaking of teachers, does anybody by any chance remember Miss DeAngelis or Mrs. who became Mrs. Zaleski? Yes. I got to talk to you after this because that woman was the most inspirational teacher I had in my life, and I spent many years in a classroom. Both, you know, after high school, I went, you know, college and then college again and a master's degree and whatever. Never met the likes of Ori Zaleski again. Wasn't she wonderful? Well, we'll talk later. But that was my third grade teacher, and she taught, she got demoted down to, I don't know, kindergarten, I think, afterwards. So my sisters had a couple of, because she was too, she was too fabulous to be teaching third grade. She put on all kinds of plays, and you know, she had me as the narrator, because of course I had the deep voice that I still have. And so she liked that. She knew, how to, she knew how to occupy me, and a lot of other teachers didn't. I spent a lot of time in Mr. Greco's office. Ever heard of Anthony Greco? Yes. Okay. 
He was the principal for a long time. Uh, he didn't like me too much. And I used to, oh God, I used to cringe when he walked down the hall because he'd see me standing in the hall because that's where the teachers would put me all the time. <laughs> and I was afraid he'd haul me off to the principal's office. I didn't want to go. Okay. Now, also in Wachung, we had politics. And I have been a political junkie since 1952, when my mother took me to Elizabeth to see a certain candidate running for president. Any guesses? Dwight David Eisenhower. And he showed up, I was eight years old, plus. I even followed the the convention and kept track of the votes. It's kind of a weird activity for an eight-year-old, but I was pretty weird. Um, and I was standing on the sidewalk as he walked up, and I had a I Like Ike banner holding it. Now, you got to admit that a little kid with skin knees and pigtails and probably a torn dress, well, not torn, but you know, kind of ratty looking. Anyway, standing there holding that banner, to my dying moment, I will think that Dwight Eisenhower turned and smiled at me. I had to be cute. I mean, come on. He did smile, right? <laughs> anyway, that's what I believe. <clears throat> my mother was very involved in politics in Wachung. She held receptions at Four Sisters for various campaigning candidates. Clifford Case, Malcolm Forbes, that's a name that may be familiar to some of you, Luke Gray, anybody who lived here then knows who he was. See those heads nodding? Ken Schmidt, etc. She was a GOP committee woman. Notice I didn't say Republican, I said GOP. There's a reason for that. And taught me paramount, the paramount importance of voting. By transporting, she constantly, for years, transported people to the polls every election day. Now, from a very early age, I became my dad's shadow, given I had an unabiding interest in the business <clears throat> that I loved being in and around the shop. I made my first sale at seven. I worked full time when not in school, from 59 through 65, when not in school. I was my dad's shadow. At age 19, I said, Dad, I got an idea. Let's go look for a place up in Basking Ridge. Don't know why I chose that. To look for a, a branch for the Valley Furniture Shop because there's a lot of building going on up there. And my dad turned to me, I was 19 years old, and he said, what are you talking about? You're gonna get married and have a family. Oh, is that what girls are supposed to do? Yes, in 1960, before the women's movement. And that tells you just where the mindset was in Wa Chung. Now, in 1960, there was something notable happening, relatively speaking. The firemen were about to celebrate their 50th anniversary, the, the volunteer fire department, were about to celebrate their 50th anniversary. They decided that they needed a queen for the upcoming parade. Kay Baumgartner, there's Chris, he knows who she is, and so does Sue. You knew her? Yes? Pardon me? She lived two doors Oh, she lived two doors from you, okay. Well, do you, then you must remember, or maybe you're too young, the whispering leaves? was the town newspaper. And she was in charge of recruiting candidates for this illustrious beauty contest. 
Christ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She would flitter into the Pratt building because, of course, people flittered in there all the time at the post office. And the fact there was a big the fact that there was a big window in the foyer where you were forced to look at the Valley Furniture Shop was not an accident. Okay, certain person by the name of H. B. engineered that. <clears throat> at any rate, she'd come in and on a regular basis in pursuit of entrance. Well, for several years, as I said, I'd been spending all or part of my weekends and vacations working for my dad. And I punched a time clock, starting in 1959 with a new building, it was in the closet. I didn't have time for or interest in beauty contests. I told you I was a tomboy. But because the anniversary committee had chosen the Pratt footbridge, and if you haven't been on the footbridge, you should because it's kind of cool, that went across the brook from the building over to the parking lot. <clears throat> Kay decided that I insisted, or she, she excuse me, Kay insisted that I should decide to participate, and I relented. So on the appointed day, I worked till 5.30, I rushed up to the house, and I got dressed to change and run back by six o'clock for the big competition. Heather Roberts, uh, anybody know that name? Uh, whose father was the, um, I don't know, the chief of firemen, whatever. And Ginger Ford from Washington, Rock Road. Remember that too? Okay, the Ford, there were two Ford families in Wachum. Um, and they've been classmates of mine for 10 years. And several, other, several others were on hand waiting to parade across the footbridge in view of the judges. Well, I won. <laughs> and the firemen were not pleased. For they had a long running disdain for the builder of the bridge, namely Harlan B. Pratt. So, I became the fireman's queen. And to the best of my very limited knowledge, you're looking at the only Miss Watchung in the 95 history of this town. <laughs> Thank you all. And I would like to add my special thanks. First, to my brother. And I promised him I wouldn't call him anything but my brother if he were to come in any other way. And I'm gonna live up to that, Rick. For his remarkable tome that he wrote in 1998, and named The Life of Harlan Buttfield Pratt. Thank you, Rick. It's really a treasure and lots of interesting things, especially to the family, but some to others as well, and I have used that for this presentation. I'd also like to thank Sue Tucker for contacting my sister, who was two years older than you in school, and my sister said for Sue to contact me, and she turned that over to the next person I wish to thank, because without Sue or Chris Vanderfleet, I wouldn't be here today. Because in March of 2020, you can see I'm still living in the 20th century, 2020, Chris contacted me, and we set up a very nice exchange email exchange over the ensuing year and a quarter. And he was the one that arranged, through Sue, for a very interesting appointment, which frankly wasn't the reason I was coming to watch him. I came here because I figured it would be one last time that I could look at my home, my beloved home that I love so much and have worried about 
For more than a decade, ever since I heard that there was rumblings in the jungle about demolishing it. No, don't do that, please. At least wait till I die. And wait till my brother dies, he's 20 years my junior. At any rate, I didn't know or even wonder about this four o'clock appointment that Sue had set up for me to meet the new, home, the new owner of the Valley Shop. I know who it was. And I really, frankly, I didn't care very much. <laughs> you know, I, mean, I, I just was glad it finally got sold, it finally got sold, because I know that Spencer Kite, um, you know, had to throw in the towel. Well, what a serendipitous meeting I had. First with Hannah, did she leave? Ah, there she is. What a delightful person who gave me a tour of the new house, AKA the Watcher Library. And then I met, rather awkwardly, actually, before I met Hannah, as we drove in the parking lot, is the gentleman, there he is, I just accused him of accosting me. He stopped my entrance as I try, as we tried to drive up the driveway. Stop, you're not allowed in here. I said, what do you mean? This is where I grew up. And, and I have an appointment to, to, with, with someone at the library and I think I'm supposed to see the person that owns this joint at four o'clock. And with that, this car pulled up next to me, and out jumped this person I'd never seen before in my life, and somehow or other, the man who had accosted me kind of backed off. <laughs> it was the boss. It was Frank Four Syllable. And, and I decided I'm getting out and I'm gonna talk to him. And so I did. And I know a little bit about the stock market. I worked at Merrill Lynch for a few years, and he's told me that you know this is he owns this company that's a uh, that's a, a public company. I said, oh, on the Nasdaq, yes, okay, and we chatted briefly, and I said, well, okay, we'll see you at four o'clock. He said, because he's like, what are you doing here? It's early. Well, we got here early, and we're looking for a place to eat, so we went. We came back, we met with Hannah, and then at four o'clock, I walked in the back door expecting to meet this gentleman over here to my left, Frank Bizignano. I did it. And I walked in and here's this crowd of people. Like, what is this? And little did I know, the mayor and uh, Councilman Jubin and and this head of the school and a few other people were all assembled. That's not exactly what Sue and Chris had, uh, uh, had uh, publicized to me. At any rate, we had a nice time and you know the rest of the story. Here I am. The last person and ultimately the one I wish to thank the most is Harlan B. Pratt, notice I said B, <laughs> who lived a long and healthy life until the age of 92 and died peacefully a couple of hours after I said goodnight to him. Thank you all. Buildings are attractive, they're cold and sterile, they're, they're whatever they are, but they come to life when you find out about the individuals that live there. And I mean, it really is an American success story, right? A small business, perseverance, um, and hard work, and, and look what group was created here. And it's part of the fabric of this town, and it's part of the wonderment, I think, of the borough of Wachon. You know, it's always been a small town, kind of neighbor to neighbor, like 29 miles from New York City, right? the airport, we're close to a lot of things, but when you come home to Wanchon, I feel like we're all part of the same family. 
Um, so I just really want to thank you from the bottom of my heart and everybody here that as, you know, again, progress doesn't always have to mean destroying the past, right? And everybody knows a 200 year old building is something historical, but there's always that period of time between something being old and something becoming historical. So Wachung is not that old of a borough, right? Um, our 100th anniversary is coming up in five years. This is part of the fabric of this town. These are the stories that should be captured, remembered for us who are now our children and our children's children. And I hope we can find a way to balance the growth of, of our borough, to, to maintain infrastructure for our residents, but keep the charm of the circle, keep the charm of this town alive and well. And we do that by the stories, and we do that through volunteerism in the town, uh, and a balance between conservation and preservation. Keep it aesthetically beautiful. When you pull up on that circle, right, that's something of pride that we should all have for us. So I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, my wife is here with me today. I told her when I met you, so I'm glad she had the time to come here as well. And all of you to come out, because it really shows me how much Watch Home cares. And you all feel similar. And for you to come back a second time, I just can't thank you. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you. The family is just five five kids that we know our, our dad pretty well, but it's nice to see everybody else kind of be in on it now. Um, and then, so I, I sat with my dad uh, when he was about 80 or so for three days and asked him a uh, hundred questions. And then I wrote them all down and then I followed up on places that he talked about and people that he talked about and wrote some more stuff down and uh, typed it all out, put pictures in it and whatnot, sent it to my family and thought it would, would be good for the family and their kids and so on and so on and you know, 256 people from there. But I'm glad that you've now been to, able to experience some of it as well. Um, I have a tiny little thing to add. I wouldn't be a proud otherwise. Um, I know the mayor is here, um, but are there zoning or planning board members here? Anybody? Okay, so what's most zoning, and this is a global question that may not actually answer what I want, but um, in most zoning codes, how high are houses allowed to be? Average 38 foot high. How many stories? Specify stories, which is the average has to be 38. Okay. Two, two and a half stories. The half story is usually an attic, right? Two and a half stories? Yeah. A Gambrill roof that Virginia mentioned earlier. My dad, being frugal, he wanted to optimize space. What do people put in their attics? <laughs> Junk. <laughs> Stuff. Uh, Christmas ornaments and lights and things that you don't know what to do with anymore in a box. Yeah. A gambrel attic is a story, but it's hiding up there in the attic. So he was he was optimizing space with his gambrel roof because most zoning codes think it's not a story; it's an attic. <coughs> so that's why he loved the gambrel roof. Wow, wow, wow. I had the cook's tour yesterday. That's a very British term. Sorry, there's my British heritage rearing its head. I'm just overwhelmed by the affluence. I don't remember Valley Road or Mountain Boulevard even having, having stripes on it. Seriously. You know, not only the, the center line, but the ones on the side. And, and the beautiful, beautiful foliage and landscaping at this time of the year is especially beautiful. Mm -hmm. And the homes are so palatial. Yeah. I don't recognize, even the ones that were here, or that are still here when I lived here, have all been either enlarged 
or painted or you know and or restored and I don't recognize even that many I recognize 30 Valley Road pretty much there are parts of it that are I uh, distress me terribly like the barn at any rate um, I uh, was also, as I said earlier, impressed with the playing fields. Didn't have those then. And um, the absence of the center, the only thing left now is a gas station yeah. there. The, 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 the shops are all gone. Yeah. That's very sad in my opinion. Yeah. The arrival of the Texture Museum, which I think is a historical um, uh, center, um, the, that building across from the house, that, that medical center, yeah. it, it's so hideous, I can hardly, I, I, I don't know if the owner's here, but I'm very critical, and as far as I'm concerned, the only thing, you know, somebody once said the only thing that would improve Atlantic City is a major oil slick, well, the only thing that would improve that place would be a uh, wrecking ball and there was a beautiful old house there that wasn't it wasn't beautiful it had been beautiful and I had playmates there and they didn't have any plumbing and it was a big house with a lovely porch and we had lots of fun playing and it could have been restored instead it was torn down and this thing was put there so I see you know mostly uh, improvements Great question. Great question. I love it. First of all, we weren't allowed to go to watch him like because it was a shall we say a minimal operation. Um, had a beach. You had to pay to get in, it was public, and in those days, there was a horrible, terrible thing called polio. And in the summer, watch on like the rest of the country, absolutely shivered at the prospect of a polio epidemic. Now, I told you my dad went into a lot of houses for estate sales, but also he went into houses to uh, give people quotes on refinishing something or repairing or whatever. And one day he took me to a house up, maybe on Cedar, it wasn't Cedar Road, but it might have, it was close to it, Valley View or whatever. Hughes Lane. Where? Hughes Lane. Okay, all right, could be it. He took me into the house. And I saw something that I obviously have never forgotten. A woman in an iron lung. Well, we all know what an MRI looks like. Most of us have probably been through an MRI. An MRI is commodious and quick in comparison to an iron lung, where people who had lived through polio were relegated to live for the rest of their lives because they couldn't breathe without it. It was horrible. Now, here's something, I'm so glad you asked about this. So, Watchung Lake was off bounds. Best Lake, on the other hand, we used to swim there in the summer, and we ice skate there in the winter. And I love Best Lake, and we all could go there. Nobody ever stopped us from going. It was a swim on your own kind of thing. There was a boathouse there. And I swam there. Remember, the how the you know, we lived in Wachung from forty seven until fifty seven when the pool was built. So that's ten years or fifty six, whatever, close to ten years. So we used at least my sisters and I I don't remember my parents ever swimming in Best Lake, but we did. And our friends did. And we had great fun. But the swimming pool was a lot more accessible, shall we say, and a lot more, I had a, you know, we had a slide, and it was clean, 
and it, we had an underwater window, which by the way, if we dug down through it, you'd still find it, because I saw the tip of it yesterday. And we could swim down and make funny faces, you know, and somebody in the, oh, it was so cool. At any rate, uh, I've never really been asked that question in that form before, but that's your answer. Now, one more thing I have to tell you. In 1956, let's call it, Jonas Salk perfected the polio vaccine. And it wasn't the save and oral, it was a shot in the arm. At the lower level of the Wachung Borough School, they converted the, the uh, kids, like the, we had a workshop class as years went by, and they converted that room instantly to a clinic. And every single school kid was lined up and put through there like so many sheep. A permission slip? No way. You didn't get to ask or question or refuse because everybody wanted the polio vaccine because it was so horrible. One of the Fisher kids, um, Stockton Fisher's granddaughter, Lynn Fisher, and I'm sure the lady behind you, Frank, would know of other people in Wachung who'd had polio. It was a horrible, horrible disease. And fortunately, thanks to the um, Rotary Clubs International, to which my son belonged and was involved with and got the same award that uh, our famous citizen in, in Western Pennsylvania, Arnold Palmer, got the Paul Smith Paul Harris, oh, my couple of, all right, Paul Harris Award. Poly, uh, the, the Rotary International was largely, am I not right, in eradicating polio from the world. The Washington House, like so many other places in the east, on the east, north, the northern east coast of the U.S., all claim that George Washington slept there, right? right? Oh, George Washington slept here. George Washington had dinner here. Well, supposedly George Washington slept in Wachung uh, before I was born. <laughs> That's a joke. Anyway, and it was a beautiful place, old, and it was the front of it was facing down Somerset Street, not out to Somerset Street. And along came a guy called George Morrow. <coughs> Remember him? Okay, well, we've got to talk about him. And anyway, anyway, George Morrow decided to save this place. And it was, a, it was, you know, it was a 1750 building. It was gorgeous in my eye. I like, you know, I like old buildings. You know, my, the house I live in now is 150 years old or more. Anyway. So he built, he expanded, he wanted to build a hotel. There's not a slight, the slightest vestige of the Washington House left today because of the big fire. And there's a bit in Rick's tome about my dad fishing, uh, putting the pipe in the, in the brook to try to get water to, uh, to put the fire out because the, you know, the fireman's group, and this was after they recovered from my becoming you know, the star of the parade. Anyway, um, there's nothing else left. 